And welcome to our conscious conversation call with Luann Beekler and myself. Um, today we're going to talk about, well, Luann <laughs> and all kinds of different topics uh, related to what she's into. She's the founder of the I Hug movement, which, as I understand it, is about hugging people that many people would not necessarily want to hug. <laughs> It's about Almost hugging anybody. Hugging anybody, spreading hugs, and, and kind of encouraging uh, basically a more uh, united connection between people, like exactly. you know, focusing on our commonalities and, and ways to connect instead of ways to uh, reject and judge and harsh on each other. Especially, this is timely, in the polarized climate we have, which seems to be going in an even more polarized direction lately. <laughs> especially with the virus situation. Mm -hmm. So welcome Luann and welcome CGCers who are on the call. It looks like several people have joined so far. Um, and feel free, you know, for everybody else on the call, feel free to make commentary and chats as we go along. The call is being recorded. Um, and we may ju just be aware that we may share this outside of, uh, of, the, uh, of the group. It's kind of up to Luann and me to decide if we want to share it outside like in, on YouTube or something, or she can share it on her site but we won't be sharing the chat, okay? It'll just be like what's actually on video. But if you ask us questions or things like that, we might include that or incorporate it into the chat, so just into our conversation, I should say. So just be aware of that. And of course, uh, the usual admonition goes to make sure um, to send your chats to, and, and I have to remind Luanne of this, uh, send your chats to go to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, if you set it to go to all panelists, only, uh -huh. only uh, Luanne, Rochelle, and myself will see it because we're the panelists. So no one saw your comments yet, yet Luann. <laughs> Make sure it goes, to, goes out to everyone. Um, this is just something, seems like a default Zoom setting. I so wish we could change this, but maybe it's for privacy concerns or something like that. But we always have to remind everybody to change it. There it goes. Now everybody Those are new settings to me already. And I've been living really? on Zoom for the last two, three months, whatever it's been now. I've gone over the setting so many times and there doesn't yeah. seem to be a way to change it for us. So I think it depends also if you're doing a, a webinar versus a meeting. A meeting is- That could be. It, yeah, or it has slightly different default settings than a webinar. So this one is qualified as a webinar and that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. That could Excellent. be. Excellent, and that's why I don't see anybody who's out there. Is that right? That's it, That yeah, because we do it webinar style. Although we could have done this one meeting style, but- um, I like, I don't know, I've just gotten used to webinar style. So anyway, okay. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you is like, where did you get the idea for this movement? Uh, why and why hugs were, you know, where'd this come from? All right, well, then I got to go all the way back to the beginning of the I hug story, which okay. started with this little button, which is hard to see on my lapel. I'm going to hold it, it up. Yep. And a gentleman by the name of Robert McPhee who is a former Transformational Leadership Council member, he gave me this button at a uh, Passionate Life Summit with Janet Atwood and a bunch of the rest of us in the Passion Test family because he knows we're huggers, right? And um, so I started wearing the button as a warning sign to people that I am a hugger and I'm going to hug you unless you stop me. And that's all it was, right? Like I thought, oh, this is cool. And then it became this human experiment because all of a sudden I'd forget it was even on my lapel and strangers would come up to me in hotel lobbies, airplanes, airports and go, I hug too. I'm like, do you need a hug? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, okay, great. You know? <laughs> and so that's what I was doing in the world. And I wore it at all the TLC conferences and when TLC partnered with the World Business Academy, and we did a transformational meeting around business with Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 company CEOs. And I said, am I supposed to hug them? Like I do at TLC when everybody arrives and they're like, yes. And I'm like, I'm not sure these CEOs are gonna be ready for that, you know? So for sure, I wore my button and warned them that I was gonna give them a hug when they got out of their limousine or off the bus. And they melted. They melted in my arms. They're like, oh my gosh, you do this for everybody? I'm like, yeah, we do. It's our tradition. And they're like, this is great. And throughout the meeting, they'd come to the meeting room. They'd go, can I have another hug? Yeah, sure you can. 
I started observing people really needing hugs, that they were missing that human touch. And then our friend Joel Roberts had an event. And Joel Roberts specializes in helping people market and brand themselves. And what he tries to do does very well. He gets to people's authentic heart. He gets to their why. Like he makes them cry on stage, right? <laughs> Typically, until they get to really telling the message. And I got a chance to go up and talk to uh, Joel on stage. And he's like, well, what do you do? You know, and I start talking about my work with the passion test and all of that. And he goes, passion, smashing. He's like, everybody's talking about passion, Luann. He's like, do something else. Do something more interesting. He's like, that little button on your lapel is way more interesting. Tell me about that. And then as it proceeded, he said, I think you should do something crazy. Like I hug across America or something. And he kicked me off the stage in Joel Roberts style, right? He's like, I'm done with you. I gave you your nugget. And off I went. And I'm like, okay, like, what do I do with that? Like, I never thought about taking this anywhere. It was just me, you know? And so I meditated and I prayed on it and I thought about it and things started coming to me. And the message was, you got to I hug across America during the 2020 presidential campaign in the face of this political polarization and bring human beings back together. That's of course. Awesome. Before I could, I started it. I did start in January to my mission to I Hug Across America in 2020 and uh, with a lot of help from my TLC family. Uh, and then of course the COVID shut the whole thing down. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the virus has changed a lot of people's plans. That was, that was a question that immediately popped into my mind is like, you know, this is a, I mean, this seems like a brilliant idea and it's, it's, it's spawned the way many interesting ideas are where it starts with you, you just following your own path with a heart and then it sort of steamrolls from there. And what I love about your button in particular is it's, it's, um, <clears throat> you're inviting invitations. It, it's, uh, it, it's telling people it's broadcasting that you're a hugger. Yeah. So, but then, but then you, you don't even necessarily have to go and invite people directly to hug you. They recognize that button and they invite you to hug. Yeah. You know, so that's, um, that's, that's really cool. It's a perfect, perfect example of inviting invitations of like broadcasting to the world, what you want to be invited to do. Uh, and it, it gives people permission to, uh, to approach you. You know, then yes. they, then they know, ah, if I ask, if I ask Luann for a hug, surely I'm not going to be rejected. Right. Right, very welcoming. Yeah. Um, and, I, and literally I forget, and it's on a lot of my clothing. <laughs> it's just there like on jackets and coats. And I was in a um, office supply store just like last week. And it happened to be on that jacket that I was wearing. I didn't even remember it was there because frankly, I've been a little bit conscious about not wearing it whenever I go outside of my house during the COVID not unsure how people would react and not sure I really do want to hug everybody right now. Um, and this woman, six feet away, she said, I love your button. And we just had a lovely conversation about it. And I have buttons in my purse all the time. And I gave her one and she was so grateful. I was like, that is so awesome. So it is a great way to make connection with people, even if I can't literally hug them all the time right now. But it's you like see, it's like a hug virus. Have you seen some of those things? That's coming after COVID, the hug virus. <laughs> Have you seen some of those Facebook um, posts, though, where people are getting really creative about being able to hug their relatives even? So this one woman took a shower curtain and she fashioned plastic arms and put armholes with duct tape and created a barrier with the uh, curtain but there were arms in them, plastic arms. So she could stick her arms in and her mother, who was a little short person like me, could stick her arms in different holes coming the other way and they could have a hug because they were worried. You know, mom was obviously um, in her later years and she wanted to hug her mom. And then her son was playing on the swing set in the back and he's like, me too, me too, I want to do it. And she had to pick this little boy up, get him to the arms, and so that he could hug. Next thing I saw was people renting um, 
costumes, blow up costumes like T-Rex and uh, unicorn and things like that, that you get inside of and then fill it with air. But you can hug people because you've got that barrier between you. Interesting. It, you know, it strikes me as only a matter of time before some marketer starts promoting the body condom, you know, <laughs> the giant sheath you put over yourself and now you can hug people. Yeah, I, it, I saw people in literally big giant bubbles like the boy in the bubble. You yeah. know, it is crazy. You're right. It's a matter of time or what would, you know, we would call a hazmat suit that will be more fashionable. So, but, but has the virus situation shut down the movement? Has it put it on pause? Or, you know, I saw it's some evidence you're, you're adapting it to virtual hugs. Like, how does that work? Right. So um, I have made an effort with that. And I do everywhere I go still talk about that. Um, it, it's uh, yet to snowball the way the other was seemingly starting to do. Um, so I feel like in, it, in a way it has been put on pause. Um, the struggle is real for us huggers being quarantined. And so I also believe when we come out of this, um, when we can hug again, that this is just going to go viral. It's going to be a big deal. So I'm, I'm patient. All things in their right and perfect timing, right? Yep. But the virtual hug, if I may, teach the audience the virtual hug is pretty simple. It is sign language for a hug. Yes. And so sign language for a hug is just like this, crossing your arms over each other across your chest. Um, some people will literally grab themselves and that feels pretty good too. <laughs> to give yourself a hug. But um, if you are in person, it's a little harder in technology, although Adam Markle on the uh, Conscious Pivot and I did this together and you look really into the other person's eyes and smile while you're doing this, right? You can make the connection even through the technology as a virtual hug. But I hear lots of people talking about, will hugs ever come back? Will we ever shake hands again? Which makes me just cringe to think of being unable to touch another human being. It's such an important piece of our energy. It's important to our health. It's important bonding with people, right? So I cringe about that. But I would say, that, that we take a gradual step back, just like everything else in the COVID process, a gradual reopening. We keep our six feet social distancing, but, but we're in the same room together or outdoors or wherever, right? Just the six feet, no technology. And then practice this. This will be the new hug for a while where you're doing the sign language, look them in the eye, hold it for 20 seconds or more, if you can, you can send love with your eyes. Totally can send love with your eyes. In the Passion Test family, at the end of all of our trainings, we typically do an exercise called the Eyes of God. And it's a song that is played. And we, we build a circle where there's people on the outside of the circle and people on the inside. So you're facing each other. Mm -hmm. And there's no talking through the whole song, no talking. And you, you like for 20, 30 seconds, you just stare in the eyes of the person across from you. And then there's a little bell that goes off and you shift to the next person and you keep doing the same thing. And by the end of this exercise, people are just sobbing because you can see the eyes of God. You can see the love, right? God is love. You can see it and you can feel it just from people's eyes. We just need to practice. We've just been so busy moving so fast in our world, zooming literally, no pun intended, by each other in the world that we fail to stop and take those moments. Yep. I, actually, Rochelle and I did a similar exercise uh, at a Tim Freak workshop. Uh, Tim Freak is a fellow Hay House author. He wrote a book called Lucid Living. And uh, Rochelle and I went to one of his workshops in Vegas uh, a few years ago. And we did that where we kind of sat in a the concentric circle. So one circle on the inside, one circle on the outside. And I think it was just the people on the outside that would move and we'd rotate chairs now and then. And uh, we would just, you know, stare into each other's eyes, just like sitting knee to knee, you know, facing each other um, and just, you know, beam unconditional love into each other's eyes. And Tim even encouraged us to touch each other if we wanted to, you know, like, like touch each other's faces and stuff yeah. and just, you know, pat each other on the head or touch each other's shoulders. 
to just express the love more. And uh, I, I don't recall what he called that, but um, it was uh, just like we spent, you know, much of the evening just doing that, like just expressing uh, unconditional love for each other. And you can just feel like the vibe in the room, like the whole room feels like it's filled with love energy when that happens. It is, right? It truly is. And that's one of the things, Steve, for me, and I bet a lot of people in the audience, if they're extroverts like me, I thought when this lockdown came in and I was still going to get to be on Zoom with lots of people, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm going to fill my extrovert bucket by being in the Zoom room with all of my friends and networks and what have you. And started seeing over the few weeks a pattern that by five o'clock in the evening, I was drained. I was emotionally drained. And I was like, I cannot do one more thing. And started looking at it more closely and realized that truly it's an evidence of the physical energy that we as human beings exude and how that energy is interacting around us all the time. And as extroverts, we need that energy that fills my bucket and I'm not going to get it through this screen. Yep. I'm not going to get that through this screen. So, so I'm really on a self care around that to give myself permission to like shut the darn computer off, even though there's people on the other side and get away from the technology, right? Um, and the introvert, right, gains their energy from being alone and, and quiet. And so some of those might be doing better in this world. I only know what it's doing to me as an extrovert. And so it's interesting. But again, evidence that we literally put off an energy around each other to, um, that I feed off of. So do you think then that introverts and extroverts, they have like different energy signatures or they, they, they require different energy sources for sustenance? Yes. Yeah. So the introvert in a setting, a public setting, a stadium of thousands of people or what have you, it, that's what's draining them. And then they're like, I, I got to go home and be alone for a while to rebuild my energy back up because it just sucks it all out of me. And I think there's, um, you know, in, in the, in, I study a lot of different personality types that are based around colors, you know, and there's, uh, the introvert is also the person who is always the nurturer and needs to take care of everybody. And they're often giving of themselves, right? So that they, all their energy is being pulled out of them in that kind of a big environment because it's just, they're giving it away kind of, and then they've got to go get it back, right? Of course, similarly, when I go into a room and I'm a presenter and I'm, you know, all high energy in front of them, you know, they call me the energizer bunny or the little spark, you know, and I'm just like, whoop, I'm out there. And then I come home and I go, okay, I got this. <laughs> because no one else is around. It's sort of a letdown. It's not that I got to rest. It's a letdown. It's like, Right, I poured it all out. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. You know, I, I I grew up very introverted. I was kind of shy as a kid too. I know that shyness and inter introversion aren't quite the same thing, uh, but you know, I always saw myself as an introvert growing up, and then I decided to deliberately try to explore more extroverted things, like getting into public speaking and pushing myself to reach out more socially. And I and now I find that I'm somewhere in the middle but it's not like a static place. It tends to go in waves, you know, where I have to be on one side for a while and then shift to the other side. When I am in extroverted mode, that usually comes out while I'm traveling, you know, or hanging out with friends. Like when I'm going to go to the TLC things, sure. um, that then I definitely feel like, okay, I'm in extroverted mode or I decide to get into extroverted mode, like while I'm on the plane, <laughs> you know, like, okay, get yourself into extroverted mode. And then I can feel social and have fun. But after several days of that, then when I come home, it's like, oh, I just want to be in my own space for a while. It's kind of, it's kind of nice not being around that energy of people. But while I'm speaking and I'm on a stage, like I'm feeding off the energy of the audience. I love that. Um, like I was, you know, yeah. in, uh, doing the emceeing thing for the first day in uh, TLC in Panama yeah. earlier this year. And I just enjoy that. I, I enjoy the energy of that. But I can't sustain that kind of thing. You know, I, I'm not the kind of person who would, uh, you know, travel 150 days a year doing speaking after, you know, speaking event after speaking event, I would totally burn out doing that kind of thing. 
Um, right. And then there, there's a part of me that loves getting into the quietude of writing or making um, audio, or, uh, audio or video courses kind of on my own, just being in that pure mental space and just, you know, or just me and Rochelle together uh, at, at home. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't feel any um, like loss of energy from the, the COVID situation just because I'm used to working at home. Uh, but I also have, of course, Rochelle to hug all the time. So that's <laughs> kind of a right. nice, nice situation. But I can feel, I feel like after being in that introverted space for so long, then I want to go out, you know, I want to go out and connect. So I do feel that desire, but right. it's, it, for me, it's always been like these patterns of waves that go back and forth and I can get fueled by either side, but not for too long. After a while, that fuel turns sour and it's like, I crave the opposite polarity. I'm not sure why that is. It just seems to happen that way. Well, and so nothing is an absolute, right? Nothing is an absolute. And so uh, we as a society tend to label people and try and make it absolute, you know, because it's easier for us if we can put people into a box or things or situations into a box and label it, somehow we feel control over that, right? So if I can label you as an introvert and have an image of what that is, then I think I know you, right? Same as the extrovert. And lots of people historically the introvert and extrovert was looked at as the extrovert is the outgoing person and the introvert is the quiet, shy person. And it's not really about that. It's about where you draw your energy from that sustains you. You're drawing it from more often um, when you ha can have quality time alone. I draw it when I'm with people and then I can keep going forever as long as people are around me, right? The minute I lose that crowd around me, because like literally when I started my own business 15 years ago, now looking back, before I joined BNI, before I had the networks I do, and I was just struggling to start a, a small business, I was home alone a lot. And I nearly slipped into a depression because I need that energy from people in order to feed me. But you don't have to be just an introvert or just an extrovert. Dr. Ivan Meisner, founder, chief visionary officer of BNI. You'd think he's an extrovert. He's going to go, no way. I am totally an introvert, he says. I have to work to be on stage, to do those things. Do I enjoy it? Just like you, Steve, once he's up there, but he's like, I got to work for it. And I got to have my rest time in between, right? I couldn't do it every day. Like, I remember when Brendan Bruchard, I went to a Brendan Bruchard event, like for 16 hours in a day, the man was on stage. Wah! Right? You know, that would drain an introvert for three days, 16 hours a day. And I mean, he was just going all the time. You know, Ivan's going to go and do a one hour keynote and then go, okay, I'm done. See you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, yep. kind of um, but there's all the spectrum in between. I uh, heard uh, the executive director of our local NAMI speak uh, recently. Uh, and NAMI is a National Association of Mental Illness, right? And it's another place where in our society, we label people. You have mental illness and you don't. Baloney, she says. We all do on some level in the spectrum. Yours might be ADHD, high anxiety, whatever, certain situations that trigger you, but it's still a mental illness, if you will. It's just a spectrum on what level you are. You know, the clinically depressed or what have you are on the extreme spectrum. And, and we might be on the other closer to what one might call normal, but there's all a whole spectrum in between there of how we all operate, right? Yep. Same with the introvert extrovert. You reminded me that when I did my first uh, three day workshop on the Vegas strip, I slept 14 hours in a row afterwards. <laughs> just from the, the you know, so much energy flowing through it. It was uh, Proof. just crazy. <laughs> Right? Perfect. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Um, like, w were you always a hugger? Like, did you grow up that way? Was that just, you know, how always, you, how you were always? Yeah. Always. See, for me, it was so different. I had to learn that. I grew up in a family where nobody hugged or touched. Uh, my dad was an aerospace engineer, engineer. My mom was a college math professor. So it was sort of like re being raised by a couple of Vulcans or androids, <laughs> you know, very logical, very rational house, but any kind of emotion too far one way or another, not quite right. <laughs> you know, you got to get back to even and calm. Um, and, and just, you know, we weren't 
like hugs weren't a part of our lifestyle growing up. Nobody really touched. If you got touched, it was because you were doing something wrong. Like you're about to get spanked or something, you know, or your arm is being grabbed because uh, you're misbehaving in, in some way, at least how, you know, that's, um, that's my perception of it. But my, my grandmother on my mom's side, she would come over now and then, and she was a hugger for sure. Um, she was this Lithuanian woman and just like very huggy person. I always wanted to hug her grandkids. So when she came over, you know, she'd always want to give me a hug and it felt kind of alien to me because it was not something I was used to because they didn't come over that often all the time, like for holidays and stuff. And so when I would get a hug from her, it would just feel a little bit weird. Um, and then I remember later in life, I just had to really work on that and lean into the experience of hugs and touch. I, you know, I've, I've gone at some point, probably like, you know, months of my life without touching another human being. Um, mm. you know, no physical contact whatsoever. And, and, uh, you know, having gone through that experience, I don't wish that on any, anybody, but it took such a long time to even figure out what was wrong. You know, when I, it's just like when I was in high school, um, I went to an all boys school. So hugging was not part of the, part of the school, uh, and you know, all boys Catholic school. And when I would go to like a sporting event, say, um, going to a high school football game with some friends, I'd noticed one of my friends who was say, you know, in uh, like he played sports or he was in drama and they would, you know, when he was in like the, the drama club and they would do some plays and stuff, he would get to connect with some uh, women, some from some or some girls from one of the all girls schools. And when we go to a football game together or something, some of the girls that would recognize him, they would just walk right up to him and hug him. And I just found that such an alien experience. You know, it was like, wow. you know, those people I was like, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we did a play together. And I was like, oh, that's like a thing in the theater community, you just hug people. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get that. Like that was just totally outside my reality. I didn't understand how that could even be possible for me at all, ever. Interesting. And so, and so that became like a long-term journey. I, that was probably one of the hardest things I had to work on in life. It's just opening up socially and through touch because it felt like such an alien experience. And I had to like push myself to, you know, hug people, offer hugs. And it felt so awkward in the beginning. And I think part of the reason is I was approaching it so mentally. It was like a head-based thing. And I didn't have the heart alignment to go with it. And it was only like later on when I, you know, did things like cleaning up my diet more and got off, you know, junk food. Um, I went vegan many, many years, more than 20 years ago. That really helped too. It seemed to like the lighter food, you know, kind of opened up my heart-brain connection more. And I could actually start feeling that connection with people. And I would notice like if I'd hug somebody, it would have an energy signature. You know how you hug somebody, you can kind of yeah. tell their energy signature. You get a read on the other person in like a second or two just from the hug. And you can yeah. tell like if that person is a hugger. Like I've hugged you a number of times at TLC events and I can tell you're a hugger because the energy that comes back is just, it's so warm. It's just like, there's no resistance to hugging. But, but then you hug somebody else uh, and it's like they're not used to it or they're just not in that space. And you could feel like the coldness or you could feel a little yeah. bit of shielding go up or the resistance. Um, and that's, that was me. And it took so long to get, to get past that. It, it really, uh, it really, um, you know, was a long journey, but you know what helped the most what? was people like you was other huggers. <laughs> you know, that was the thing that actually, um, helped me, uh, resolve that finally was like hanging out with more people like you with that huggy vibe. And I got to tell you, it was not comfortable at first. I felt like an alien in that space. I could tell immediately, like, I don't belong, like I'm missing some component of myself that doesn't fit there. And uh, those people gradually cracked the crust off my heart, you know, like little by little till it could open up. But I think I really didn't get it until the heart was aligned with it. It's not just a matter of getting it at the head level and deciding you want to move into that. Although that's where it started for me. It was just kind of the head level, kind of recognizing right. that other people had a skill or an ability that I didn't. And it was really curiosity that drove me initially. Oh, that's interesting. That's fascinating. But that it that's probably the truth. If we did a research on it, an analysis of it, is the difference between people who are living in their head versus their heart and fail to have that connection between the two. I wonder what the, the correlation, the ones that live in their head are not huggers. The ones that live in their heart are, you know, that would be an interesting sort of study to do, but you said a couple of things that I want to come back to. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, all about your journey on the uncomfortable. The reason Robert McPhee 
made the button and created the button was because he went to a Jack Canfield seminar on success and he thought he was going to get success principles to grow his business. And in the first exercise at this conference of three, four, five, six hundred people, I don't remember how many, he wrote the introduction to the book that I wrote about this. Anyway, he tells his story and he went to this seminar and he was so mad at Jack because Jack did this exercise. He said, before we get started, hug as many people as you can in the room. And Robert was like you, he grew up with none of that. He didn't know that. And he's like, wait a minute, this is a business seminar and you want me to go hug strangers? Forget it. He was really mad, but he did it because you're now in this room with people and everybody else is doing it. So he did it and realized, oh my gosh, that was so enjoyable. You know, his heart sort of opened up as he hugged more and more people, it peeled back the layers and he let that out. So he created the button so that he would get more hugs. That's how it all began. And um, then you said that during that journey, that there were times when there were months when you didn't have any hugs and you knew that that was detrimental. You felt that, is that right? Not a, not a <laughs> um, like maybe in my early twenties, um, I kind of noticed something was off, you know, but I noticed, I noticed other people had a skill that I lacked or other people were having a different experience of life that was just alien to me. So it made me feel more socially distanced from people. I felt a little bit, you know, different from others. I would still have friends and we would hang out. We, you know, I'd have poker games together and things like right. that. But the whole touch affection thing that I could never get into that world, you know, it just felt like it felt like an alien experience to me. I didn't understand what was wrong with me or missing with me. I didn't understand like how other people could find it easy. Cause for me, it was just Challenge. using a struggle, like not even necessarily a struggle. Cause I didn't even know where to begin. <laughs> I just thought maybe, you know, right. something was off with me. Uh, but I, I couldn't fathom, you know, now it's just the opposite. So now when I look back on my past self from my early 20s, it's just such a different type of experience, a different flavor of life. And I just didn't realize at the time what I was missing was that heart connection, that heart alignment. I was um, insensitive to what my heart was showing me. And I found that opening up that connection and developing that and developing a stronger um, sensitivity to what my emotions were trying to tell me instead of suppressing them, uh, that create, you know, that opened up that whole world and it, it did a, you know, a much bigger world of good beyond that. It's one of the reasons my business has done well is because I'm very in tune to the sensitivity of my emotions and my inner harmony, my inner alignment. And I can kind of get a sense of other people's energies too, because when you're in tune with your own heart, you can read other people way more easily. Uh, you know, in my first few years um, in, in business, I, right out of college, I started my own computer games business, uh, you know, developing, right. trying to sell computer games. And it didn't go well the first five years. And one of the main reasons was I just got into business with bad business partners who I, I shouldn't have trusted in the beginning. And now looking back, you know, there were clear signs that these were not the, you know, honest or competent people that I should have been dealing with. I should not have been dealing with them at all. Um, and, but I didn't have the, the, the emotional intelligence to recognize that, you know, I was just going with pure logic and rationality and, and not, not um, paying attention to all the signals that were coming through. And I was just blind to those emotional signals. And those have been such a powerful guide in, in business and in life. And what's also interesting is something you probably don't know about is on Monday this week, I posted a blog post called, what are my strengths? And I invited my blog readers and customers just to email me back and tell me what they thought my strengths were. Uh -huh. and, so, and so I got lots and lots of replies and I, I spent some time going over them and you know, reading them and thanking people for replying. And then I kind of compiled all the key phrases and keywords into a big list. I'm gonna do a blog post on that today. I was working on it before this call, so I'll publish it later this afternoon, uh, what the results were. And, and I basically sorted into about a dozen, dozen categories and, you know, of, this, of strengths that people identified in me, and this is their perspective. And what I found most fascinating is that um, their perspective on my strengths is different than my perspective. I mean, it does align. There was nothing I really disagreed with, but nobody pointed, I think, to the deeper strength that gives rise to a bunch of these things, which, uh, which I'm commenting on in the, in the blog post I'm writing, 
but it's, it's the sensitivity to my inner harmony, to my feelings, to how I feel about certain things. Like they, they would say like one of my strengths is the breadth and the range of topics I write about. But the reason I write about so many different types of topics is that I'm really sensitive to boredom. <laughs> and so I don't narrow my focus. Um, I like to jump all over and you know, cover a lot of different types of things. And there are other strengths too, but they, they derive from that inner sensitivity, from that heart connection within myself. And so what I realized is, is like, wow, it's like so many of the strengths that show up in externally in providing value for people, yeah. they come from pursuing inner harmony. And that's how we can create, that's how we can express ourselves into the world, you know, as a, as a creative person. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that's a, you could write a book on just that, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, on, on, on learning how to get in tune with your inner harmony in order to be the better you and more creative and express yourself in the world in the way that you want to. And you're right, again, what I said earlier about us being, you know, on Zoom, and I'm not talking about this Zoom, I'm talking about we're moving so fast in the world that we're not taking time to get in touch with that. Lots of people aren't, you know, and that's that, thus the work of the passion test and how valuable it is to me and to people in the world is that it, it, it is uh, what, it's a non-threatening way to open their heart. And it's a simple yet powerful system that gets people in touch with their internal desires and wishes and really gets them to sit still long enough to think about it. I mean, that's my experience anyway in the workshops and uh, coaching that I've done with people using that tool and that process is that, yeah, you sit in a three hour seminar you get a chance to tune everything else out and really go inside. And then the tools of the passion test really help you to stay in alignment with that. Right. Yet. Yeah, and you know, you have other tools that you use as well to keep in that inner harmony, but it's very similar in nature. And I think um, I call it as like a, an entry point into the self study, right? It's a, it's a place where, the average person can enter and start to have that conversation. And just like myself, like I've been working with it for 10 years. Well, then I begin to dive deeper into other areas and other tools, meditations, uh, what have you, you know, all of the TLC tools that come around to our, the power of intention, et cetera. Um, so that, that's where I like bringing the passion test to the world is to get people to take that first step of self-inquiry. Yep. getting in touch with that inner self there's some interesting questions that i just noticed that came into the chat yeah to some of those yeah uh rochelle did you notice some question i see one question uh which is how are you coping during covid as, as an extrovert luann yeah so i kind of think i already said that right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think you addressed that to some extent but I, like I, is, um, it, is it really difficult for you i mean is you feel like something well, I, I'm just like I'm getting in touch with the emotion right Steve it's really knowing my inner self and so now I have to say shut the computer walk away right and get away from this which is draining me um and and go even a phone call seems better to go hang out and shit chat with somebody to bring back that people connection um in my state in Minnesota um, we're back to being able to have small gatherings of less than 10 people. So the other night was the best night in the last couple of months. And I have my sweetheart at home to hug too, just like you have Rochelle, you know, but it's different. I'm used to hugging lots of people, you know, getting lots of hugs a day. Anyway, so I had five women over to do one of those in-house painting parties where the artist teaches you how to paint. You know, like that picture up there is one of them that I've painted. And these women, uh, friends of mine, very close people I know, not just strangers, right, came over to my house for the first time in a couple of months. And we hugged and just hang, hung on to each other. They were longer hugs than normal, than you, you would average have when you used to see each other. We held on. We held on and we had the best evening together, laughing and giggling and painting silly pictures. And it was all good. 
So I will be doing more of those things to bring my energy back from the other human beings that I need to be in touch with in order to give me strength, give me my spark and so forth. So that's my advice to extroverts where you can is bring in even small groups or better than no groups of people. And the other question, we can come back to B&I and we'll talk about that if you'd like, um, is same, same with the labels like Democrat and Republican in terms of putting people in boxes and giving them labels. Absolutely agree with that, right? And so this is something that happened to me on my iHug tour. By the way, for your audience and for you, if you just to be clear, the iHug movement is a nonpartisan movement, okay? It is not about politics. I was trying to combat politics and the polarization with a simple human hug. And every place I went that I did get to go, I ended up putting myself in the political arena because guess what? That's where the cameras are. And so I thought if I show up hugging people where the cameras are, I might get a little media and help spread this movement across the country. Like I can't do it all by myself, right? It's really about getting people fired up and to hug in their city, state, town, right? To bring people back together. It's not truly about me being seen traveling the country, but spreading the message across the country, okay? I just don't think it's wise of me to encourage people to go out and hug right now during the COVID. That would not be good, but we'll do that later. Anyway, so I went to these political places. I went to the Iowa caucus. I went to the New Hampshire primary. Um, and at the New Hampshire primary, I ended up at a Pete Buttigieg rally because it was close to my friend's house who was putting me up for the night. And it took like an hour or more before he showed up on stage from the time they told you to be there. So I'm walking around this big crowded room, reporters everywhere, and I'm hugging people. And finally, the reporters were bored with talking to other people. And they're like, what are you doing, lady? <laughs> What's this crazy lady doing walking around hugging everybody? And I had a little sign even that said free hugs. That looks like one of those uh, uh, vote signs, you know, that people will carry around to vote for their candidate. Anyway, um, and so the reporters started interviewing me, even including Fox News. But every one of them asked me, who was my political affiliation? Who was I gonna vote for? And because I would not take sides or tell them what my personal opinions were, they none of it hit the news, none of it. Wow, that's disappointing. You know, the, Fox, the Fox News guy, his big old microphone, I've got pictures of it, had his big old microphone in my face with the Fox News. And when I, he got to that question and I wouldn't tell him who I was gonna vote for, he put the microphone away, took out his cell phone, and he said, this will be good Twitter information. And he continued to talk to me because he personally was interested, but he wasn't going to get it on the Fox News station. Yes, it was disappointing. In fact, I started to say to them, I said, why are you asking me that? Our system is designed to be confidential. I have no need to tell you who I may or may not vote for. It's confidential. That's the point. Why are you asking me? So they didn't like that. Me, you know, it strikes me that it would be more controversial, though, if you offer this hug and then you pick a side afterwards. And now they got something to pick on you for. And it makes it yeah. probably more interesting clickbait, you know. Because they want controversial. They want, you know, they wanted me to pick a side to, so they could make an argument with me. And that's what the news is always trying to do, right? To, to make an argument, to fire people up, to make crap happen like happening in, Minneapolis, excuse my language, in Minneapolis in the last couple of days. It's like, it's, it's just out of control. And this is what I was trying to combat, right? This way of getting it. Let's come together and find the solution, you know? Um, so when I went to... Uh, I got to go back to another story. When I said to my friend that I was going to start doing this I across America, she, a, a staunch uh, Democrat, was like, you can't do that. You can't do that. Someone's going to hurt you. Like, it's not safe out there. 
Like, no way. There's too much hate in the world, you know? And I'm like, yes, I can. (laughs) (laughs) That's just what I want to combat, you know? And at first she was really literally afraid for me. And then she called me up like a day later and she said, all right, you think you can do this? I got a challenge for you. Trump's coming to Minneapolis. I dare you. Go hug people at the Trump rally. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. I'm up for the challenge. And I had my big old sweatshirt on that says free hug. So no one missed what I was there for and signs and buttons and stickers, the whole work. So it had little stickers made like boat stickers that say I hug that I passed out to people if they gave me a hug. And um, Minneapolis did a really great thing. They, he was speaking in our Target Center, one of our big arenas, and um, uh, where the front door is, where most people would typically believe you're going to go in, they barricaded it off and they created an area close to the street so that a group was gathering there, but all these people were going through the Skyway system and the parking garages, and they were funneling the other way, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, they're like, we're going to funnel all the supporters this way and let the protesters be out here in front where they think they're going to be interacting with the supporters, right? So they did a great job of separating the two sides. Well, all the people were going this way, so I followed them. And I found myself right outside the I, what I would call the back door, if you will, and lines and lines of Trump supporters. And I'm standing there with my hug sign and not they'd step out of line and they'd come and hug me. And most of the time they were just appreciative I was there. They're like, thank you so much. This is what we need in the world. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the hug. They were just lovely, right? It was a lovely time. A Couple of them were skeptical and going, what are you up to? What are you trying to do here? You know, but just a couple. And that's okay, they didn't come over and hug me. They were like, no, thank you. And I'm like, okay, no big deal. Just trying to spread some love. You know, and after we did that for a while, and I had a couple of friends who were observing, they thought they needed to be my bodyguards. They were not hugging. <laughs> they were observing. And um, they said, well, these old, oh, these people in the line kept going, you got to go hug those people over there. You got to hug those people over there. They're the ones that are angry. They're the ones that need you. Go over there. And I'm like, where's over there? Which is when I found the protesters on the other side of the building, on the front side of the building. And here's the protesters, and they're blowing whistles, and they're wearing masks over their face. This was before the COVID. This was last November. And, you know, they're being hateful and nasty. And carrying signs that said, hate never cured hate. And I'm like, then why are you asking, acting like that? Because you're acting in a hateful manner. But I just hugged them too. I didn't get into a discussion with them about what they were doing or what I thought of their behavior. I just hugged them too. And guess what? They said the same thing. Thanks for being here. This is what we need in the world right now. We really appreciate it. I want a hug too. You got another one of those signs? I'm like, yep. Passing out free hug signs to bring people together. That's what this is about, the I hug movement, right? And again, I only put myself in the political arena because it's what's causing the polarization and because that's where the media is to help spread the message that hugs heal and they're a better answer than what is happening per se in Minneapolis right now. Fascinating. You know, what? one thing that may be challenging for you is uh, getting good visibility on the ripples that you're creating because those could easily be invisible to you. You know, like you, you may hug somebody that day and you don't know how it affected them. You may influence them to become more of a hugger type. I'll bet you most of the people who influenced me to become more of a huggy person over the years, they're not aware of the effect they had and how, just how profound it was. And it's not necessarily just one person one time, you know, doing it. It's the cumulative effect over time, but it can make a huge difference. Uh, one, one example that comes to mind is that the first uh, workshop I did on the, on the Vegas Strip, uh, it was at Hera's. Uh, yeah, in uh, 2009, October of 2009. And at one point, somebody in the audience was asking for um, extra challenges they could do. And so I, I said, okay, one of your challenges is to go out and see, see if you can get a hug from a random stranger uh, in five minutes or less. 
you know, of starting an interaction with them. And so somebody in the audience, you know, said, okay, I'll try, you know, I'll try that. And he challenged himself and he, he did it a few times and he, he eventually got it down to like, like 90 seconds or so, and then 45 seconds and, you know, he kept practicing it. Um, and uh, he would, he got it down. He was from uh, Belgium and he went back to Belgium and he kept practicing it there. And I've been told that I've never been to Belgium, but I've been told it's not a very huggy country. Uh, and he, he said he got it down to like 15 seconds where he can meet somebody and be hugging them within 15 seconds. And then he told me, he emailed me and said, okay, I got it down to pretty much instantaneous. I can just hug a person basically right away, often without even saying anything. And I was like, what, how, you know, how do you do that? And I said, it has to be a willing hug. You can't just grab somebody. You're not just like walking up and grabbing people. I said, no, 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 they're hugging me. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, how do you get somebody to hug you without even saying a word? And he didn't use any buttons, you know, no, no like messages ah. or free hug shirts or anything like that. Um, and so he, uh, he was gonna come to another uh, Vegas workshop of mine at a different hotel. I think this one was at the Flamingo Hotel a year later. And this one, um, he said he would demonstrate it. So after the workshop, we went down to like downtown Vegas and a b bunch of people from the workshop and him and I, and I we went, went down there together and we, we, we um, uh, you know, watched him demonstrate this. And so he would walk around like downtown Vegas, um, basically just smiling at people and putting his arms out like this. And sometimes he would go like, you know, like make, make a little hug motion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, motioning towards him. And about half the people would hug him. And he said he could always tell. He said if they gave him a weird look, like, you know, what are you doing? They would avoid him. But if they, if they paused and smiled, he's like, if they smiled, even if they took a while, even if it took them like 30 seconds or so to finally hug him, they would eventually do it. If they didn't give a creeped out look, then they would eventually hug him. And he didn't even have to say anything. Sometimes you would say, come on, you know, give, give me some love or <laughs> how about a hug? Uh, and people would just do it. And I was like, that's fascinating. Um, and, and get this, between that first workshop and that second workshop, he actually got diagnosed with uh, cancer. He mm -hmm. had a large tumor in the center of his chest. Oh my. And uh, I think it was about six months after that second workshop that he actually passed away from it. Uh, so he was only, I think, 28 years old, something like that, oh when he, when he died. So young guy. Um, and he, uh, but, but he, ins you know, he inspired me. I'm like, if he could do this, I mean, while he was going around hugging people, you know, his, he lost all his hair from the chemotherapy and, and such. And, he, you know, he, he was just like wanted to spend, you know, his time encouraging people to hug and to love. Well, he really inspired me at that, at that first workshop, you know, I was the kind of person who would greet people coming to the event with handshakes. And there were about 115 people at that first event. After that, I gradually thought, you know, if he could do this while he's going through, you know, cancer treatment yeah, and yeah. still be hugging people. And, you know, he would do free hugs things too uh, on his own. And I thought if he's encouraging people to connect that way, I got to step up my game too. So he inspired me. So I decided after that, everybody who comes to my workshops, I'm going to personally greet them with a hug. So I would stand at the registration table, you know, from, from then on. I'm not sure exactly when I implemented that, this. I think it was sometime in 2010. Uh, and I started, you know, offering everybody a hug. I wouldn't be just grabbing them forcibly, but I would offer everybody a hug. And I noticed it made a big difference. Like people appreciated it. And I also encouraged everybody to hug each other. And I, I encouraged the staff to hug everybody too, you know, at least offer everybody hugs. So generally before people got to their seats, they probably had at least a half a dozen hugs before they even got to their seat. And I noticed a difference in the quality of the event. Normally that first morning of a three-day workshop, it's, it's a cold start. You know, you, mm -hmm. are, they've just come to town. Most of the people that come to our workshops are coming from out of town, many from out of the country. So, you know, they're, they've been traveling, some are jet lagged. They don't feel connected with everybody in the room yet. They're trying to feel it out. When I ask for volunteers for anything in that first morning, you know, the hands are very tentative. But when I switch to the hugging instead of like handshakes or just, you know, in, uh, like, like more casual greetings and such, um, it's like it fast forwarded us a day or a day and a half. You know, the, the workshop does warm up over time and it always did that. But now it's like we get to skip that cold start entirely and people feel immediately more connected with the whole group. They feel like, exactly. you know, they're part of the community. They feel welcomed. Exactly. And it really does create that warmer energy in the room. Yeah. So it's really amazing how transformative that is. It is. And it's a simple hug. And then, you know, that's another place where I 
learned it, not learned it, where I got to express it when I was working with Janet Atwood when we had live conferences and, you know, Passionate Life Summit, Live Your Destiny, whatever the topic was, right? And I would be serving her by helping with those events as a facilitator. And that was one of my jobs. I'd be in the lobby hugging people as they came. And so we ended up putting on the back of our t-shirts, all of our volunteers, Master Hugger. And, and we created, we call it the love bubble. And, and everybody knew they were walking into the love bubble when you came to our events. And all we just hugged all over people to create that and to let people feel safe. If they, they feel safe after they've had that initial hug. It's like, you're a safe person. You're not going to hurt me, which is another interesting conversation. Because <laughs> the other thing that people have said to me is, I'm a woman, right? And I'm going out there and putting myself out there to get hugged. And in the Me Too movement, right? People are like, aren't you afraid that people are going to touch you inappropriately? And I'm like, never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind. And I believe because I don't put out the energy of fear that you might, that I don't attract the people that would do that. Right? Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't have it within my consciousness that someone is going to hurt me in that way or that I'm afraid of someone hurting me in that way. And so I don't attract that type with me. It's like they say people who get attacked, forgive me, I don't want to offend anyone because they're walking around in fear. The, per the, the, um, what a perp, I don't know what the word, the, the person that might hurt them senses that energy senses in them, the fear. So they know they can overpower them. Right. And since I don't walk with that fear or intention of, or idea that that could ever happen to me, I just don't attract it. So I, I don't know if everyone would agree with me on that. <laughs> it's an energy thing again, right? I think it's the energy we put off. No and so like that, I'm sorry, like that gentleman though, but this is really fascinating. I, I don't even, I've had uh, several situations just before the COVID hit uh, of people that I happened not to be wearing my button. And in fact, one of them was my, was a pharmacist at a Walgreens and I'm picking up my, and they, they, there's this barrier between us, right? And for some reason, the man says to me, I'd hug you except for I'm stuck back here. And I'm like looking for my button thinking he saw my button and that's why he said that to me. And he's like, I don't know why I even said that to you. I'm not even a hugger. <laughs> Like I put out this energy about hugs that is just out there now in the world. And so I, people know it and they're attracted to that energy. What do, what do you say to people who don't see the value of hugs? Like they just say, well, I'm not a touchy person. I'm not the touchy feely type. Like I always wonder how I would ever convince my past self. If I could go back in time and talk to my past self, I don't know if I could convince him, <laughs> like, you know, even, with the, even with what I know now. And so, if I told him, like, wait, I'm you, he probably still wouldn't believe me. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I don't try and convince anyone, right? It's an invitation. Yep. And so there is a potential that I'm not interact. I'm, they're not attracting to me, right? They're not getting in my circle of influence because they're just not attracted to me. Um, and so I'm not interacting with them. So I don't try and convince anyone. Uh, there was a one circumstance way in the beginning of this in a hotel lobby uh, when I just had started wearing the button and uh, approached a woman and she like went panicked. Like I was just approaching her to have a conversation, but she saw the button and she put her shields up and she said, don't touch me. I don't hug. I went, God bless her. I hope, you know, she can deal with whatever demons are going inside of her. So inside of me, I'm blessing them to heal some other way. You know what I mean? Um, and give them some gift because she was obviously putting shields up. So in that situation, I walked away thinking someone hurt her. Someone violently invaded her space and hurt her. And that's why she can't hug and touch other people. That's my diagnosis. It's just a, I don't know. I never found out. Now, fast forward to the Pete Buttigieg rally 
in <laughs> New Hampshire, a woman came up to me and she did one of these. I don't hug people like your hands up. I don't hug people, but lady, I got to know what you're doing. Why are you doing this? You know, again, she's like, you're crazy. And I told her my mission. I said, this is what I'm doing to spread hugs in America. And I think we need more hugs in America. What do you think? And she's like, we do. And she gave me a big hug. Just that simple to turn her around, you know? Um, I just share my passion, right? Share my message. And if you can relate, then you're gonna turn around. And if you can't, I'm not gonna try and push it. You know, and I think it's the nonpartisan in me. And another theory I have, right? We need to stop needing to be right. Let's talk about that one for a while. <laughs> we need to stop needing to be right. Think about that audience. Really think about that, right? When do we get at odds with someone else and get into a fight? Family member, friend. It's when we take a stance and we are determined to be right, that what I am telling you is the truth. Well, it might be your truth. It's not Steve's truth. It's not my truth. That's okay. We don't have to have the same exact truths in my world, right? I'm here on a journey to learn lessons that me and my soul need to learn, and I'm being given the clues to do that. And what, what, the way I see the world can be completely different than the way the others see the world. And I wanna tell you a great story about what I mean about this, okay? So my sisters and I decide we deserve a break and we're gonna to go to Key West on a vacation, just the girls leave the kids at home. And tell what, we got this whole group of women going and one of them gives birth to a new baby and she's like, I can't go if I don't bring my baby. Okay, bring the baby. Well, next thing you know, all the kids are there. So now we've got all these women and children in August in Key West. Never, ever do this. Right? Smoldering hot, sweaty, awful. It was the worst trip of my entire life. And I complained about it, told stories about it for years. And my sister's like, what are you talking about? It's a fabulous trip. It was the best trip ever. It was a great trip. So from their perspective and the experience they had, it was a fabulous trip. Mine, no, it was awful. But I don't have to prove to the world that it was an awful trip. It was great for them, good for them, right? It wasn't good for me, okay. Luann, you don't have to convince me it was fabulous. You're not gonna change my mind. We don't have to be right. We can see the world from different perspectives and have our own experiences and even be in the same place at the same time and it's okay. Yep. You know, one thing I found is you mentioned invitations and it, it requires a bit of an invitation from somebody to change their mind. They have to open their mind and be willing to change. They have to open their mind and be willing to have a certain experience. And sometimes I've, I've found that people have biases and expectations on others, especially people with different belief systems, people from different cultures that they project onto them that may not be accurate. Like when I, uh, well, when, uh, when I travel a bit, uh, sometimes with Rochelle, um, I've done some meetups in different cities around the world. And just like for uh, readers of my blog, and I'll, I'll, like we've done you know, a couple in New York City and, and a bunch of other cities. And one time when I was gonna go do one in Paris, people said, oh, don't try to hug the Parisians. They're not huggers, you know, they, won't, they won't hug. And so I said, well, let's find out. So I went there and offered them all hugs and everybody hugged and they hugged each other too. And, you know, the only thing was like, sometimes they thought you were trying to give them a kiss on the cheek because it's like a thing in the, the just the cultural sure. difference. But when they realized you're hugging, they're like, okay, great. And they were all fine with the hugs. And then one time I was doing an event in, uh, well, I was speaking at a friend's event in Berlin. And I was thinking of doing this exercise where I was going to get everybody hugging there. And it was a, it was like a men's dating conference. So it's a bunch of German guys. And, and they said, oh, don't try to do hugging with the Germans. That's not a thing with their culture. You know, don't do that. <laughs> uh, and, and I said, well, let's find out. Uh, so I, you know, I actually invited them to all get up and hug each other. And after like three minutes of that, you know, they were just kept going. And I was like, okay, take your seats. And they're like, no, no, we want to keep hugging. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> so the funny thing is, is like, 
their culture may frown on that and may condition them not to do that. But when you give people permission and you invite them to have that kind of experience and they like it and they want to follow that invitation, then it's hard to get them to stop because they're like, when are we going to get a chance to do this again? When do we have the chance to just hug each other like this? It's not part of our culture, but here in this meeting room, we can do it. And so it was kind of a, an eye-opening experience. Uh, and I found like, uh, you know, what you mentioned about like the vibe, you know, attracting stuff. I, I found that it's, it's, it's tricky to get past the vibes that limit you and like open yourself to new experiences. But one of the things is you want to question the social conditioning that tells you how people are. You know, that's like that aspect of being right. And I, I think it's, you know, something that can be more powerful than being right is being curious. Uh, you know, people, Absolutely. people warn me about things when I travel, like certain cultures are this way, don't try to do this thing or, or expect to have a negative experience in this particular dimension. You know, people tell me Parisians, they're rude. Uh, don't expect, you know, much kindness from them. And uh, I've been to Paris a couple of times and Rochelle has spent a good bit of time there. And, you know, each time I've gone there, I found nothing but kindness and generosity and, and love. And, you know, it's just been beautiful. <laughs> One time Rochelle and I were, were struggling to get my credit card work working. Uh, the American credit card at the time just was not working on the, the, the transit system, the Metro in Paris. And I couldn't get, I, I tried a couple different cars and I couldn't, I was trying to buy some uh, Metro tickets and I couldn't get the machine to work. It wouldn't accept my card for some reason because I didn't have the chip in it. Uh, I think it was the problem. And this was, you know, some years ago. Yeah. Uh, and this Parisian woman in the line behind us saw that we were struggling and she, she comes up and she, um, she buys us a, a carnet of tickets, a, a 10 pack of tickets. And she says, just give me two and keep the rest. And I said, really? You know, I started pulling out cash to pay her because I had some euros in cash, but the machine I was using was cashless. So it didn't take those. Uh, so she's like, no, no, no. I, I just want you to know that, uh, you, know, you know, I could tell your tourists here and I just want you to have some kindness from, you know, from a local so that you have a good trip. And I, you know, I just want you to, you know, have a good time while you're here. And, and just experience that generosity, something like that. And she, you know, she spoke to us in English. And I, I thought, that's, you know, lovely. Thank you so much. And she just wouldn't take any money for it. And, she, and then she walked off. And I was like, wow, okay. So it's partly just like, you know, you open yourself to those kinds of experiences. But I think a part of us has to invite them because I saw none of this kind of stuff. I saw, you know, this, this the kindness from strangers and the, the hugs, the touch, the affection in my life. I had to choose to step into that. I had to say, I want to experience and explore this, even though I don't know what I'm doing, even though it doesn't feel quite right to me, even though I'm kind of scared and trepidatious about it. I had to choose to step into the discomfort before reality could meet me part way. Right, Otherwise, so, none of those opportunities came through. Have you found that kind of thing to be true for you as well? So right in, in the work of the passion test, right? What you did is you set your intention. You set your intention to have those things in your life. And that which you put your focus on grows stronger in your life and your powerful intention on that focus. And so what you were doing in your trips and being curious is you're looking for evidence to the contrary of what people were telling you. You tell me they don't hug in Germany, well, I'm going to look for evidence where they do. And then you found it. And this is how it works in our life. If you look for evidence for where you're wealthy, where you're happy, where you look for evidence of joy in your life, you can find it even in the COVID, right? You know, lots of people are looking at what they've lost because of what happened with the shutdown and the quarantine and the COVID. Well, turn it around, folks. Look at what you've gained. Have you gained closer relationships to your spouse, to your kids? Are you playing basketball in the yard with them now when you never could before? You know, what are the, the positive things that are coming out of this? And you start to see more positive things. If you continually focus on negative things, the things that you lost, well, you get more of that. That which you focus on grows stronger in your life. Other people say it, that which you appreciate, appreciates. If you appreciate it, if you value it, you get more of it. It's gratitude, right? <laughs> so there's all these messages that, that swirl around the same kind of conversation and different people's experiences with them and they might language them different, but it's very similar. And in the passion test, we say, you're setting the intention for what you want to create and then you put your attention on it. You do need to take action. 
in that direction. You took action to look for it, right? Where is it happening? Where can I see that I can get a hug in Germany? Where people in Paris are fabulous, wonderful, generous people. And there it was. You got to see it. Yep. I often approach the idea of intentions. I think I, I stumble on that from, from the perspective or the lens of doubt. Uh, when, you know, when people say something is a certain way, that's the kind of you know, model I grew up with when I was younger, you know, like being raised in you know, Catholicism and kind of in that bubble of reality and then deciding to explore outside of that uh, later in life you know, I, I realized just how limiting it can be when you're in a, in a thought bubble. And so that's always made me suspicious in life about what kind of thought bubble I might be in now, because if I'm in a thought bubble, I don't see it. You know, by a thought bubble, I mean like the collection of your beliefs and your expectations, which you could also frame as intentions. You know, like observation is a form of intention. It's the intention to continue the status quo when you observe in, in such a way that you judge and you limit things and you define them as they are, they can't necessarily budge too much beyond that. You know, you, you tune out the signals that could invite you to leave that thought bubble then. And so that's made me wonder, like, you know, when people share their thought bubbles, do I want to enter that thought bubble? Do I find that thought bubble limiting? What kind of thought bubble am I in? And I've, I'm always like questioning it. Like where, how do I get past this? Where are the cracks? How can I break beyond this? And to leave a thought bubble is uncomfortable, though, because then you're stepping into the unknown, and that often feels uh, odd or uncomfortable. You know, it's uh, it's unfamiliar. Uh, and and I think one of the key things in life, especially when you want to be on a long-term path of personal growth, is getting increasingly comfortable with discomfort, with the exactly. unfamiliar. <laughs> the more exactly. you can, the more you can stomach the unfamiliar. The more you can stomach stepping into the uncomfortable. I think the faster you can grow and it, yeah. it takes a form of courage, but I think it also um, takes a certain alignment with truth of realizing that you're so often inside some kind of thought bubble, perhaps always, and it has walls and it has limitations that box you in. And so you always want to be questioning yeah. that and doubting it. And so that's, that's my path to intentions is like through doubting what's real and solid right in front of me and how flexible it may be. <laughs> Because I know in the past, I've missed the flexibility of reality. I've missed opportunities that were there right in front of me because they couldn't get into my thought bubble. Right. And, and so I know I'm missing something. Exactly. I, know, I know I'm blind to something. And just being aware that you are blind right now is really empowering. Right. Absolutely. Chris Atwood, co-author of The Passion Test, um, says it's standing in the middle of the fire of your own discomfort. You got to stand in the fire of your own discomfort in order to grow beyond that. And, and the world, society, teaches people to be conformists and to be comfortable and to be okay with comfortable. I say, you know, we say, people say they're in the comfort zone. And I'm like, no, the comfort zone is not comfortable. The comfort zone is a safety that I'm not gonna think about anything else. Like, I'm not gonna question, I'm not gonna wonder, I'm not gonna be curious because this feels okay here, so I'm just gonna stay here. And you can't grow from that, right? So you got to step out of the comfort zone in order to, to grow, just like you're saying. And I was just at a conference. Um, uh, you heard Guy talk about CAM, Guy and Donna. Did you, have you spoken at CAM? I haven't spoken at CAM, but I attended the virtual version of it. Oh, just yeah, you were there. That's right. Yeah, I saw I was, you. I saw on you on the, the camera. Call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw you on the camera. Um, but were you there for the wonder conversation? Yeah, yeah. And the wonder shop, that's exercise, what you're talking yeah. about to me, right? Is to always wonder instead of think you know the, the facts is to be one, in wonderment. Well, I wonder if it could be different than that. I wonder if that's really true, right? I wonder if I have to do it that way. Maybe no. You know, the other one that speaks to some of this is um, Don Miguel Ruiz in He's the former agreements. What? He's a good hugger. He is a great hugger. You know why? I hugged him in an elevator one time, I think. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, first of all, right, he's a little guy and I'm a little gal. So we fit together. <laughs> yep. But when I hugged Don Miguel Ruiz, like I felt unconditional love. And that's what he teaches, right? Like he, he embodies it. Right. And I didn't want to let go. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. 
I didn't want to let go of that. But anyway, he teaches just live by these four simple agreements, right? And one of the, one of the things in his concepts is question every other agreement that you've made because they might not be valid agreements anymore in who you are or who you've become. I mean, we, we make all kinds of agreements with other people in our lives. And are these agreements really where we want to be living anymore? And I always tell a funny story, real simple one in my workshops about this concept. And that is that it's, and he talks about that we've been domesticated. We've been domesticated the way in which we domesticate our animals, right? And that society domesticates us to fall in alignment and do as you're told kind of thing, right? Rather than be in wonder and exploration. Um, so I tell the story about my dog. So my dog had an agreement with my husband that anytime the dog came to the side of the bed, no matter what time of the night it was, middle of the night, and barked at him, that my husband would get up and he would take him outside. Oh, it got worse. There were times he would come to the side of the bed and bark and he didn't want to go outside. He wanted an ice cube. And <laughs> My husband would get up and give him an ice cube. When my husband was traveling and he was not home, that dog never came to the side of the bed and barked at me between the hours of 10 p.m. and 10 a.m. because I wasn't getting up. We didn't have the same agreement. Never had an accident, never had a problem. He just knew he and I did not have the same agreement that he had with my husband. But these are the little tiny agreements we make and how we work with people in our lives and maybe they're not true. My brother had a stroke and I stepped into an agreement with him that I made, that I had to be there for him every day. And, and I became his caregiver and my business started to fall apart emotionally. I couldn't handle it. And it was a TLC member that said, Luann, you're trying to control his story. It's his story. It's his experience in life that he had this stroke. You do not have to own that story. And I went, whoa whoa, I got to change this agreement because I'm falling apart here trying to make him better. Does that make sense? So yeah. I encourage people to question those agreements in your life. If they're not working for you, then what, does it really have to be that way anymore? Maybe I no longer need to keep that agreement. Hmm. You know, this connects some dots for me because I, I, you know, I know the four agreements and I haven't, I haven't really connected the, the dots before, but what you shared just, you know, it makes me realize that uh, this kind of connects with a model that I use, which is, uh, I, I think a lot about my relationship with reality. And I didn't really frame it as agreements per se, but I do think of it a lot, a lot in that way. I think of it as co-creation, like co-creating with reality. So I often like will have conversations with reality, uh, you know, aloud, like just in my office by myself, I'll <laughs> float ideas off the ceiling or something as if I'm talking to the universe or talking to reality. And I find that really powerful. I'll, you know, sometimes I'll do journaling exercises where I just have a conversation with, with reality. And I, you know, you can do that through, you know, meditation or through spirit guides or any, or things like that. And I find all those are just different, you know, levels of abstraction. And I, I actually find it simplest just to talk aloud to reality itself as if I'm talking to the simulation of life. And, uh, and I, um, I feel like it helps me figure out solutions to problems and challenges. It's like a way of dialoguing through it. But what I realize also is it's, it's a way of negotiating an agreement, you know, yeah. figuring out something. Like if I want to do a business project, I'll float, you know, like what, okay, reality, here's my idea. What do you think of it? And then I kind of channel the answer back. You know, I'll go like, I think that idea is crap. You know, I, <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're playing too small. Or I think this is like, you know, you're doing this as a head-based thing, but where's the heart in it? And I'm like, damn you, you're right. You know, it's like, it, it tells, it shows me the holes in the, in the, in the intention, you know, and that, okay, let's go back and let's try this intention now. And a way, it's a way of bouncing things off. And it also helps me resolve how I feel about it. And the agreement I want to make, not, not just with external reality, but with my internal self. Yeah. Do I feel like this agreement is aligned? Do I feel, you know, do I feel the alignment there? And my best projects are the ones where I can feel that alignment is there. And I just feel like there's the excitement and there's the passion and the energy to fuel it all the way across the finish line. Uh, to completion. And those projects have done great when I've, when I've done that, when I've turned to, you know, too much to the head, kind of tune out the heart and like, well, here's a lot of, a lot of head-based reasons for doing this project. 
then I can scarcely get myself to do it. It's like then procrastination comes in and I'm always putting it off sure. and it doesn't feel quite right. It's like, it looks good on paper, but the, there's a part of me that doesn't agree with it. And I, I feel like with the agreement right. idea, it's, it's also about getting the different parts of you to feel harmonious, to I feel aligned with it. Some part of you might object to it while other parts might like it. And you have to negotiate with them as well and say, well, what don't you like about this heart? Or why is it, why have this weird feeling in the pit of my stomach right now? And what's going on there? Or why, you know, why is there's like this feeling of trauma coming up associated with this? Where's that coming from? You know, where, uh, where's the, why is there fear being generated? What's, you know, what's that about? And, and there's, so that's the wonder, right? That's the wonder. It's like, that's I wonder how wonder. I can get all these parts agreeing. And is there, is there a path to an agreement that does feel aligned? And that's always tricky, but it does work in the end. What I love about that, and thank you for that, because I'm going to start doing that. You just gave me permission to talk to myself out <laughs> loud, <laughs> which I do anyway, but most of the time I'm, I'm self-conscious about it or I'm concerned, you know, and my husband travels uh, four months out of the year. He's in the golf business. So he leaves the snowy state of Minnesota and goes to Arizona and I'm literally home alone for four months, you know, and I talk a lot to myself then, but I haven't really phrased it. I think I've been failing to phrase it really the way that you're talking about and, and then be open to the listening. And so my aha in this for, for our listeners is that I think what most people do instead, they're going, I want, and I can't have, why can't I have what I want? Why don't I make more money? Why don't, you know, and they're going to the negative side. And so they're focusing on that negative instead of being inquisitive with the universe in that state of wonder and go, well, what should I be doing today? Like, could I do this or could I do that? And, and there's this voice that comes that helps you to get in alignment with your heart. And the more you do it, I bet, Steve, the more that you practice it, the more that you trust that voice that feeling, that harmony and go, yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm going to just do that. And so I had a coach once that told me to throw away my to-do list. She's like, stop it, throw it away. Get rid of that to-do list. All it does is stress you out and, and prove to you there's a ton of things to do. Just get up in the morning and go, what is mine to do today? What is mine to do today that needs for me to serve in the world? And then do that thing that comes to your mind. And the next one and the next one and trust that it's all unfolding in its right and perfect timing. And if it, maybe there's thing on that list you never even need to really do. You just thought you did in your logical mind, right? Yeah. I do like having a projects list as long as I've kind of, <laughs> you know, felt the heart aspect of it and that's a part of it, but it's always changing and evolving. I'm shifting the order of it sometimes. Sometimes I, you know, uh, uh, you know, move projects further up or further down but I, I, do, I do use that idea when it comes to blogging, like to writing articles. Um, like this year, I'm blogging every single day. I made a one-year commitment at the start of the year to write it, you know, publish a new blog post every single day of the year. And I've not missed a day so far. And, I, and Excellent. There's, no, there's no, I don't have any editorial calendar or any editorial list. I, don't, I have no idea what article I'll write tomorrow. I don't have the idea for it yet. Each morning, I just ask, okay, what am I supposed to write today? What's the idea? Um, I, I found... I found a good way, you know, if you like the idea of dialoguing with your reality, a good question to ask now and then is, what do you want from me now? Is mm -hmm. like, invite reality, in, you know, invite at least some like kind it. of response. Ask that question. What does life want from me now? Instead of always right. trying to generate your answers internally, like listen for a request, listen for an invitation, uh, you know, ask interesting questions. The better your questions, the, the, the better the answers you get. If you, the, the, the suckiest questions to ask are ones like, how do I make more money? You know, reality doesn't really care. <laughs> it doesn't care. Right. It, does, it has a hard time getting excited about that kind of answer. It's just, you're going to get crappy answers usually when you ask that. But if you ask right. questions like, how could I do something that excites me? You know, or what is really fascinating to explore right now? Uh, and then you can tack on and make money <laughs> at the end of it if you really want to. That can work. I think, I think, well, in the passion test, we say, stop worrying about the how, create the dream and stop worrying about the how. So I avoid how questions, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm, it's not my job to know how, right? I'm co-creating with the universe and it's going to unfold and I have to have faith, right? A lot of this to me is faith, faith that I will be guided 
into where I'm supposed to be, right? And so it's asking, you know, different questions like, what? What do you want me to do now? Okay, just tell me, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, that that's, I think, though, Steve, where some of um, our less transformational people would say we're a little woo-woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, I used to be very anti-non-woo-woo, and I found that with a with a non woo woo approach, I didn't get the results I was expecting, and so it it caused my it caused my mind to open up. One of the big things that made me more humble and inquisitive was going bankrupt. I went bankrupt in 1999. My computer games business, you know, went just went downhill. I sank into 150 thousand dollars of debt. Wow. I was making like 300 dollars a month from my video game sales at that point. And I was like, this is not working, and so I, I ended up declaring bankruptcy. And I I thought. I want to keep doing this business though. You know, the computer games business still appealed to me. I just had to find a different way to do it. And I initially I was trying to focus on how do I get success and get published, get a game on the shelves, you know, get some accolades going, get some income coming in. And all the, all the goals I set were very self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time I was, I remember listening to this audio program by Brian Tracy and he talked about the power of volunteering. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know what, that's something I'd never tried before. And what made me, you know, when I was kind of in this place of, okay, whatever I did in the past five years didn't work. So my commitment is not to do any more of what didn't work. <laughs> like nice. let, if it didn't work, it didn't work. And it, I didn't have any good reason to believe that if I did the same stuff for another five years, that it would work any better. So I said, I've got to do something that's different. You know, it, it could be randomly different even, but if I at least try enough different things, maybe I'll find something that works. But clearly I can't go back to what I've already been doing because that didn't work. So I, I hadn't tried volunteering in my, you know, as part of business. So I thought, let's just try focusing differently. You know, let's change my patterns up. Let's break everything that didn't work anyway <laughs> and try to replace it with something that does work. And who knows? And so I got really curious. I'm like, let's just try something radically different. So I started volunteering in a trade association, uh, which today is still around. They're called the Association of Software Professionals. And I just started trying to help out other independent software developers. There are about a thousand members or so. And I started writing articles for their newsletter. I, I tried running for the board of directors and I lost by four votes, but my, my plea was kind of so passionate that uh, they appointed me vice president because the vice president just in a timely manner decided to retire. And then the next year I became president. So I never actually won an election in that organization, but I became <laughs> vice president for a year and then president for a year of this nonprofit organization. And, I, and, and it's just all volunteer. There was no pay for doing that that work, but it, it totally shifted my thinking because instead of trying to focus on making my own business better, I was trying to help other people with their businesses. And the mm -hmm. funny thing is, is that I went up, I, you know, my income like 10 times very quickly <laughs> to the point where it's sustainable. And then it went up even more after that. Uh, and it's just like, it became very sustainable within like a year or so, not by actually trying to make my business more successful directly, but by finally reaching out beyond my own little self-absorbed bubble of my own self and my own team, and let's reach out to other people in the industry. And I thought, and yeah. even the, you know, the lessons I learned, which were mostly about what not to do, they, they still benefited other people. And I was actually able to provide value for people through my failure experiences, yeah. you know, like learning what not to do. And, and, the, and the funny thing is like, it just, it was such a, a, a crazy mindset shift. I didn't expect the results would come in so, so quickly, but that showed me also just how a change in mindset, it, it's, it really can be about finding better results. You know, yeah. like if your old mindset, you know, ask yourself, hold yourself accountable. Is this getting the job done? Is this getting results? Are you in the flow of abundance? You know, like not just financially, but are you in the flow of abundance, abundance socially? Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Are you satisfied with your life? You know, do you wake up in the morning feeling excited for the coming day? You know, what's the, what's the overall flavor of your life? That's your result. Um, and you know, is that working? Is your approach working? Because if your approach is not working, then you got to realize your old mindset sucks. <laughs> it's not getting the result you want. And you have, to, you have to dump it and you have to explore outside of that. And sometimes it's just a matter of doing the opposite. It reminds right. me of this episode of Seinfeld where the character, uh, George Costanza, his life's not working. So he finally decides, I'm just going to do the opposite of whatever my gut instinct tells me to do. 
and he his life starts improving dramatically when he does that you know he just whatever his instinct is he goes does the exact opposite of that and i i don't know he gets like you know like all these things these positive things are flowing into his life by doing the opposite of what wasn't working anyway and you know, yeah. while that's comedy it also works in real life <laughs> Well, and, but I want to question one word you used there, right? And I haven't seen that episode, but was George, instead of listening to his instinct, because I would liken that to my intuition, and actually what I'm telling people to do is listen to their intuition. However, what George was really, what he was reacting to is what he thought he was supposed to do in the world, what he thought, like, I'm supposed to go to work. Well, I'm not going to go to work today, right? Well, he totally went against what he logically thought he had to do and found that when he trusted to just go the other way, great things happen. Yeah, it probably yeah, was more potentially like that. that. More like and that, of course, right? that's, a, that's an artificial example because it's a comedy TV show. Yeah, I that's, understand. It's scripted, but it, you know, right. in real life, so is there, it is about just you know, trusting that it, it's partly intuition. rational, just seeing like what, what I'm doing right now is not getting results. It's not working. Right. And then sometimes it's those inner signals that can give you impressions on where to go next. Right. So, so the, the, the contrast here is that, okay, so I, I hire a marketing coach and she's going to say to me, well, you have to be on social media and you have to do this and you have to do that from her perspective of the world. Right. Yeah. Yet I have a real struggle from my perspective of the world with how social media works and why would I want to even be there? And what I know is that when I sit face to face with someone, Zoom or in person, that is when I connect with someone. That is when they will become my client. It's not being on social media, right? So she's telling me what I have to do, what, you know, kind of like George probably thought he had to do for his life to live up to what other people's perspective of it is. And you got to trust your own perspective of it and know about how you're connecting, how you can win. And that's the shift that people need to make in their mindset. Stop doing what everybody else is telling you to do, what you think you have to do to be in conformant, to be, yeah, to conform in society, to be as successful as that guy. I got to do exactly what he did. No, he's a different person. You don't have to do exactly what they did. And that may never work for you. And you have to do what you know is right for you. And really what you also came around to, Steve, is being in a place of service to others rather than serving myself, rather than self-serving. I want to serve others and help them be successful, which now I've come full circle on the, um, well, first of all, two Zig Ziglar quotes came up while you were talking, right? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If it's not working, change it up, right? Otherwise, you're just going to get the same results that you got before. Yeah. And now I just lost the other one. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, never needed to be said today. But what, what I was coming back around to was the person that was interested in a little more about B&I, and I'm un unsure what exactly they were talking about. But, oh, I know what the other Zig Ziglar quote was. You can have anything you want as long as you help enough people get what they want. Yep. That's not exactly quote perfect, uh, I don't believe. But anyway, you got the idea. And um, that's the giver's game philosophy that we live on in B&I. If you give of yourself to help other people be successful, you will naturally gain in return and gain your success yourself. So we focus on giving first to others. How can I help you? And then naturally, so it's, it's a simple analogy as if, if uh, you help me move into my house, uh, the day that you need to move into your house, I'm going to show up and help you. I'm going to give right back to you, you know? So if I help you get referrals to grow your business, if I help you attract clients to your growth club, right? It, naturally, I'm going to gain a return. And it might not even be a direct reciprocal that you give something to me, but the universe will. So that, that's what we live on in b and I. And if that person is still online and has any more questions about what that organization <laughs> so, is about. So b and is sure. Business Networking International, right? And that's... It's Business Network International. Business Network. 
international. Because player. what we emphasize is it's more than just networking. Anybody can go out and do that. It's about building a professional network of people who support each other in growing their business by referral through tools like word of mouth marketing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we only allow one person per profession in each chapter of BNI. So we focus our loyalties on one another. And what it does is it creates a sales force. Someone like me, like you, independent consultants, I now have a sales force of 57 people in my BNI chapter. Beyond that, as a BNI director, I oversee, support, consult with other chapters, like five of them. So I have that network. And then BNI Minnesota is one of the largest regions of BNI in the world. We have 169 chapters in the state of Minnesota. And that's part of my network of people that I know. And it just expands from there. But in the small chapters, uh, you know, usually around 40 or 50 people, it's about committing your loyalties to one another. And if my neighbor needs a plumber, the guy in my chapter who's a plumber is going to be the first person I connect them with. That kind of thing. So we all help each other as each other's sales force. And I've been in the organization 15 years. It is the primary way that I have grown my business and sustained my own business for 15 years. Wonderful. Yeah, when I got into the service flow, I just never left it. You know, it was more than 20 years ago that I figured that out. And I was just like, this is night and day, how well this works. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of weird at just how I had to get there by thinking just through logic and rationality. But what keeps me there is more the heart side because it just feels so good and it feels so aligned internally, emotionally. If I could have had that emotional awareness to guide me there from the beginning, I could have figured it out much faster. Figuring it out at the head level is very difficult. It's really hard. You know, it makes you question what you think you know all the time. And you, you, it's because you don't have the foundation of understanding to figure out why it works. Because right. it, it can, it, it's, you know, first glance to the, to the head, it looks counterintuitive. How is helping other people when I'm in scarcity going to possibly help me? You know, like I'm broke. I, I started volunteering <laughs> When I was broke, I'm writing articles to help other people and I can't even pay my own bills. <laughs> you know, like how could you justify doing that? My head could have easily talked me out of it. But I basically said to my head, hey, you had your chance and you failed. <laughs> <laughs> I like you, it. You didn't perform. You didn't get the job done. You didn't get results. So I'm not listening to you anymore. <laughs> you can whine at me all day about it, but I'm going to go try this totally different thing because, you know, maybe it's going to work differently. And it, it, was, mm -hmm. it was like kind of like a Hail Mary pass is what it felt like at the time. But it actually, sure. it actually worked. And then over time, I began to see the logic of it. And, you know, I think it, you can frame it at different levels. You can see it as a spiritual level. You could say mm -hmm. how it's like it shifts your vibe because only a, a person who's in, who can get into a state of abundance can give when they don't have. You know, right. Because you have to step out of the scarcity thinking, the scarcity mindset to be able to give generously of your time, you know, of your energy, when you feel like you don't even, you're not even getting enough for yourself. And that, right. that really throws, you know, everything for a loop. <laughs> it, it, it changes the, the way the matrix of life responds to you. And it's like, oh, that person can't be in scarcity. They're obviously in abundance. So let's just shower them with abundance because that would make sense. Sort, sort of how life responds, at least that seems, seems that way on some level. You can also see it on a social level that when you are kind and generous with other people, it creates a sense of reciprocity and, and, you know, directly they may help you when you're nice to other people, when you're caring and you're kind and you're giving, they're going to flow a lot of opportunities back to you. You know, you see that through BNI and I see that through, through blogging and, you know, through writing and speaking and sharing. When I put stuff out there to help other people, they help me in turn, like all the interesting invitations in my life, they come through other people. You know, so many, so many different things, all the ideas, the business models that I had when I started blogging, uh, you know, that, that actually made it sustainable. All the ideas were from other people. They, they were like, here, try this idea for generating income. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I'll try that. <laughs> and that, they actually gave me the ideas to monetize uh, my work over time. And um, it's, it's, you know, I get the ideas for creating courses or workshops from other people. It, it, all that flows back. It creates a very symbiotic uh, relationship, you know, a co-creative one. So then it just made me want to lean more into the co-creative ideas. And then 
you know, to develop pretty much everything, it's, it's a co-creative process now. I just lean into that. I'm like, hey, let's do another course. And what, you know, what do you think of this topic? And I float the ideas before I even have to launch something. And then the launches always go well because uh, I've invited other people into the creative process, in, into the solution. I'm not just like trying to generate something internally that I think will make money. I'm looking for a problem that needs a solution. I'm looking for people who need help. And, you know, you can, you know, I found I could just give so much away for free. Like most, uh, like all my blog posts are uncopyrighted. They're donated to the public domain. I don't even need to own the intellectual property because nice. when you're, when you're just in the flow of, of helping people and being of service, it flows back. But yeah. the really, the real part that kind of rattles my brain a bit is that it doesn't always flow back through direct reciprocity links. Right. Like you can help somebody over here and it flows back to you through a totally different channel that doesn't seem at all connected to where you, you put value out. Right. And so maybe it, there's, there is some kind of deeper thing that happens, happens energetically. You know, I always wonder about that. I do think there is something to it because I can't explain the, the floodgates that open up and how night and day different it is when you focus more on being of service than of worrying about yourself so much. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's a blockage that a lot of people carry because society teaches you to focus on the money. Yep. You know, and so and what you did is you walked in faith. You walked in faith and said, I'm just going to go do the opposite. I'm going to serve even though I have no money. And look what happened. The universe returned money to you. It's awesome. Remind me, it reminds me of Ken Honda's book, um, Happy Money. Happy Money. I love Happy Money. Have you read that one? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, me, uh, me too. And it's, you know, he, he talks about the concept of, uh, uh, so original version of the book is in Japanese, but he talks about the concept of arigato in, arigato out. So thank you when you receive money, when it comes into your life, and say thank you when you spend money, when it goes out of your life. Uh, and that's something that really helped me connect um, I was good at you know, receiving it, but I thought about that more on the spending side. I grew up in, in you know, in, in a, I grew up just learning to be very frugal with money. Um, my, my family wasn't broke growing up, but they, they taught us to just be very frugal. And my mom would, you know, I always hear my mom's voice in the back of my head when I think about purchasing something and she'll say like, you know, oh, you don't need that. Like whenever I was a kid, you know, and we go out shopping or something, and I'd be in a toy store, I'd be like, I want this, I want that. Like my mom would be like, no, you don't need that. <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, well, I guess if I don't need it, then I can't get it. You know, I can't have it. Uh, and then in life, it was always hard for me to purchase things that I might value and appreciate because I would have that voice clicking in, that, that belief that says, ah, you don't need that. And, uh, and I started, you know, getting a clearer sense of when, uh, when I would actually buy something that I would truly appreciate it, you know, when I would spend money on something like a trip, and I've, I've noticed I pretty much never regret trips I've taken, even if it was a bit of a financial stretch to take it for the experience, the memories, it's just amazing, you know, like I value it. And I don't remember the sacrifices I might have had to made to be able to afford a trip. Right. It's just, I remember the trip and how wonderful it was. And so it's it's helped me lean into um, you know, even very generally, like leaning into having life experiences where I feel like intuitively, if I did it, I would appreciate it, but I, I can't necessarily back it up logically and rationally why I should spend the money on this. Uh, right. a, good, a good example is um, back in 2016. Well, for many years before 2016, when Rochelle and I finally did this experiment, I had an idea to do a weird 30 day experiment. I do a lot of 30 day experiments and blog about them. <laughs> And this one was to spend 30 days in a row going to Disneyland, like every day, all day for a whole month. Like, can you oh imagine my. what it'd be like to spend a whole month of your life at Disneyland? Well, I grew up an hour away from Disneyland. So I've been there many times growing up. Um, and I thought, you know, it's a, it's a fun place to, to go. And I thought, what would that be like? Because it's multiple layers to that. So, if, uh, you know, I shared this idea with Rochelle and we thought about doing this together, but of course it's weird. You know, you have to deal with the social reactions, the judgment, People are going to think, oh, what are you doing? You know, this is like a waste of your time or you're going to get bored. Uh, but I, it kept coming up intuitively as a thing to do. And I didn't know why. But finally, I decided to, to kind of lean into it. And there was one time where Rochelle and I, this was like sometime in 2016, we, we blocked off a month where we could actually do it in the fall. It was, most, it was mostly like um, 
I think it was like October 25 to November 23, I think were the dates in 2016. Uh, so it ended just, it would end just before Thanksgiving. And we got annual passes. Uh, so, it's, you know, just pay for an annual pass and you can go as many times as you want. So it, it worked out to be something like $25 a day for each of us to do the experiment. It wasn't that, actually that expensive. Uh, and so we were going to book an Airbnb to actually do the experience. Well, I hovered my mouse over like the book, you know, book this <laughs> button because we found an Airbnb near Disneyland. We could rent for a whole month. And uh, I was like, Rochelle, should we do this or not? You know, should we do this or not? And we kept talking about it. And I there was no way rationality could answer that. <laughs> no. I couldn't make that, there was no logical reason to really do that. And finally, I just like, you know, I'm just gonna let my body decide and it clicks the button. So we book it. Uh, so, we, so we do that and it was actually one of the best experiences of my life. It was, it was a lot of fun. We never got bored. We know Disneyland really, really well now. <laughs> um, but it was, it, was, it was multiple layers of an experience too. It's 30 days outdoors. It's 30 days of just being with your relationship partner. This was, yeah. it was a couple of years before, about a year and a half or so before Rochelle and I got married. Um, and it was really good for our relationship too. We, you know, I think we grew closer the, through the experience. We created so much bonding and all these happy memories and fun experiences. And Fantastic. we could do it differently each time. You know, every day was a slightly different experience. We could mix it up a bit. Um, but the, one of the key gains I got from that is I kept thinking about how Disneyland was created by, you know, by Walt Disney it was, you know, his baby, he spawned this idea and it wouldn't have existed without him and how much has grown to this bigger thing uh, with a life of its own that no one person really controls or even understands entirely. But he got the, he got the ball rolling with it because he thought big and he didn't have it all figured out in advance. And, you know, he passed away many years ago, but it eventually became something, you know, way beyond his original vision but he got it going. And that made me think, you know, um, where can I think big? You know, if a guy who started doing mouse drawings, you know, and mouse animations, you know, Mickey Mouse cartoons could end up here. You know, if I could start with writing articles, like what could I create? And that, um, that was one of, one of the key experiences that led me to create uh, Conscious Growth Club, which opened about, you know, opened for early access about six months later. We started in April, 2017. And now we're beginning our fourth year together, which is, which is amazing. Um, and I don't think I would have done that if not for spending 30 days at Disneyland. Cause it was, it was like, it was being in that immersive environment. It was, it was the experience of entering a world that someone else created and being inside their world. And even though I'm like, okay, I don't really want to be in a world with large rodents walking around all the time. <laughs> you know? It's not like, I, I, I don't necessarily resonate with all of Disney's values. But to have that immersive deep dive into somebody else's value space, it ignited my own curiosity about what kind of value space could I create if I right. did so more consciously and deliberately? And what could we invite people into? What kind of experience and, and uh, you know, collective energy could we create together? Uh, and so it was just that trusting of the intuition, trusting, you know, the the arigato out, the thank you, I want to yeah. spend the money this way. I feel like I would appreciate it and I don't know why. It's just a, it's, a, it's an instinct. Um, and right. trust, trusting, trusting that, that intuition again. Yeah. So much of life is about trust, you know, learning to trust the signals that come up and learning which signals you can trust and which you can't. Yeah. And I call that faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I call that faith. But yeah, that's awesome. So, how many people in your growth club? Uh, right now, I think we have 88. Nice. Yep. So it'll That's be, excellent. you know, it's different each year. We, we only open once a year in late April for, for new members. Um, and, uh, and we just have like a one year experience together and people can renew and we do coaching calls and we do, um, we, we, you know, we, they have access to all the courses and we have a private discussion for them. But the, the basic idea of it is very simple. Collect growth oriented people together in one private online space, not on Facebook, you know, no advertising or anything like that, just our own private community. And we basically encourage the heck out of each other <laughs> to, you know, to, grow, to grow and to have different experiences. And we do monthly challenges together. We do quarterly planning sessions. There's all, you know, it's grown into all these different things. Uh, we have a 24 seven open Zoom video chat channel where members can connect all the time and talk live if they want to talk really? about Really, that's interesting. We have subgroups that popped up recently. Like there's a book club, there's a movie club, you know, so some members will watch a movie and then they'll discuss it together. Uh, 
there, you know, some aspects of it are more for just the social connections and others are more like, let's do an interesting uh, deep dive together. Yeah. So, like it. Yeah. It, and it, it works. <laughs> I like it a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. It's been fun. Uh, Good. Well, I, I feel like, I feel like the energy of the call is probably, you know, the point where we should wrap up. Um, does that feel good to you? Yep, feels good to me. Okay. Feels good to me. I was gonna uh, say I put in the chat um, my email address. Okay. If anyone wants to reach out to me, and I'm not. Somebody asked about getting buttons, and I'm like, huh, really haven't finished that project, have I? <laughs> <laughs> the I hug buttons. Where yeah. people can buy buttons from me. Oh, I gotta get that finished. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to have people reach out to me. I'm kind of looking for that perfect uh, marketing partner who knows those things because I just, I just dive forward into creativity and <laughs> imagination, right? And um, taking the steps along the way to. Okay, but as for the website, it's ihugmovement.com where people can learn more about the ihug movement. Yep. And I put that in there too, ihugmovement.com. And uh, they can follow me on Facebook at ihugmovement is on the Facebook as well. I already shared with you, I'm less than an expert out there on that, but uh, I do still have a presence. And um, on, the, on the website, I'm actually trying to gather people who are interested in joining me as a volunteer to hug in their city or state. And so there's a form people can fill out uh, to get connected to me that way too. Uh, and again, we're, we're just at the beginning stages of this I hug thing. It was awesome. supposed to be a big boom in 2020, but now we're just at the beginning and it will be big boom later. I think, it, I think like you mentioned, it could be a good thing though. It's going to compress the, the spring where, you know, everybody's going to want hugs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> What's happening. The struggle is real. <laughs> yep. I'm seeing, uh, yeah, I'm seeing that effect with, you know, a number of people's, um, livelihoods and businesses and things it's like and also just their internal motivation and their alignment it's like this is a compression it feels like we're compressing things and then there's going to be an explosion of energy afterwards when it can maybe in phases maybe is it'll be a little bit bang? No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll be a little waffling for a bit but you know, who knows maybe like five years from now we'll see like you know i hug everywhere that would be really yes cool. we will Have we're that. setting that conscious intention together today i love it the power of hugs yeah, I, would, I, would, I would certainly love to see that spread. So I'll share that intention with you because certainly hugs have been very transformational in my own life. So I can definitely get behind That's that fantastic. one. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank Thanks you, Luann. It's been a for pleasure. having me today. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> yep, I've quite enjoyed it. All right. And thanks everyone else on the call. Um, and we'll get this posted later today. Okay. All right. Awesome. Love hugs to hugs everyone. to everyone. Hugs to everyone. <laughs> Take care and we'll see you later. Bye for now. Bye.